The deadening sound of skulls smashing against each other echoed across the Juarez bullring. The year was 1907, and an American bison and a Mexican bull had just collided head-on. Promoters had brought the two animals together with dual purposes. They wanted to see which of the beasts was tougher, and they wanted to make money. Having sold 10,000 tickets to the event, the promoters had accomplished the latter goal. The only thing that remained, then, was to see whether the buffalo or the bull would be the first to fall. The mastermind behind the fight was rancher James Scotty Phillip. Although he would later become synonymous with the American West, Philip was of Scottish birth. In 1874, at the age of 15, he and a group of his fellow Scotsmen immigrated to the United States, where they founded the ranching town of Victoria, Kansas. Things did not go well for the new arrivals. Instead of raising cattle as they intended, many of the young immigrants took to drinking and playing sports all day. Money soon ran out, and most of the Scotsmen packed their bags and returned to their homeland. Not Philip. He went in search of gold. In 1874, George Armstrong Custer and the 7th U.S. Cavalry discovered gold on Sioux territory in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Although it was federally recognized Indian land, white miners flooded into the Black Hills to make their fortunes, and towns like the infamous Deadwood soon sprang up to accommodate the new arrivals. The Sioux fought back against the violation of their territory, but the U.S. Army defeated them and forced them to accept smaller allotments of land as reservations. Philip would make his home on one of these Sioux reservations. Among the first to arrive in the Black Hills, Philip tried mining, but circumstance kept him from profiting in the endeavor. So Scotty, nicknamed for his Scottish ancestry, returned to herding cattle and soon became one of the wealthiest ranchers in the Dakotas. His success owed, in part, to Sarah Larrabee, an American Indian woman whom Philip had wed while living in Kansas. Larrabee's Indian ancestry allowed Philip to pasture his herd on Sioux land, something prohibited to whites without Indian relatives. Philip grew rich off this territorial monopoly, remaining on the Sioux Reservation until the U.S. government opened the land to white settlers in 1898. In response to the new competition, Philip purchased a considerable amount of pasture land near the town of Fort Pierre and relocated his livestock. In 1898, Philip's herd included not just cattle, but also buffalo. American bison, more commonly referred to bu as buffalo, are 700 to 2,800 pound mammals native to North America. Herbivores, buffalo are rarely aggressive, using their horns only when necessary to fend off bears and mating rifles. Buffalo historically ranged across the North American plains from Alaska to Northern Mexico, where they formed the basis of Plains Indian society. Their meat provided sustenance, and Indians used buffalo hides as clothing, teepees, and trade goods. Because buffalo were so important to native culture, Indians fostered buffalo growth by periodically burning the plains to create pasture land. With this help, the American bison population grew to nearly three, 30 million head by A.D. 1500. By the time Philip acquired land near Fort Pierre in 1898, the buffalo population had dropped to less than 1,000. The animal had become a favorite target of American hunters, who had moved onto the plains in the mid-19th century. Part of the westward expansion of white settlers from the burgeoning United States, these hunters followed the railroad, shooting upward of 100,000 buffalo per day for meat to feed railroad workers and for hides for clothing, international trade, and industrial use. Using high-powered rifles that could drop an animal at 1,000 yards, Hunters also killed for no other reason than to hurt Plains Indians, who depended on buffalo for survival. By 1880, hunting, along with the introduction of competing species and bovine diseases, had brought bison to the verge of extinction. Scotty Phillip developed an affinity for buffalo while living on the Sioux Reservation in the Dakotas. Each year, he would witness herds crossing the plains during the seasonal migration, only to see them return the following year fewer in number. Admiring the buffalo's majesty and tranquil nature, Philip decided to do, to do something before hunters could eradicate the animal. He purchased bison from a neighbor who had rescued calves during a buffalo hunt and began raising the animals on his property near Fort Pierre. By 1907, Philip's bison herd had grown to some 1,000 head, making his ranch home to more buffalo than the rest of the world combined. Philip's efforts, an end to the West Indian Wars, and Buffalo Bill's Wild West Circus, uh, Wild West Show, which featured American bison, made the United States sympathetic to the plight of buffalo. 
By 1905, the American public was clamoring for the government to create reserves for the endangered animals. With the support of naturalist president Theodore Roosevelt, the people of the United States unofficially adopted the buffalo as one of the nation's mascots. Americans grew proud and protective of the animal that they had almost brought to extinction. Philip catered to the renewed interest by selling buffalo from his ranch to parks, zoos, and circuses. This pride would lead Scotty to match one of his animals against a Mexican bull. According to one version of the story, when a group of Mexican dip diplomats visited Scotty's ranch in Fort Pierre and saw their first bison, they began to mock the animal for its slow and lumbering nature. Philip took offense to their jests and boasted that his buffalo were tougher than any fighting bulls in Mexico. He would even prove it by setting up a fight between the two animals. Another story says that Philip was visiting Texas when he overheard some Juarez men bragging about how tough their animals were. Uh, Philip wanted to show that his American animals were tougher. Yet another version holds that Scotty came up with a plan while drinking in a bar on Christmas. Whichever story is true, Philip wanted to show that American bison deserved respect. Philip had the buffalo and the desire to put on a fight, but he did not have a Mexican fighting bull or even a place for the combat to take place as American cruel, or animal cruelty laws in the ASPCA would not allow such a thing to occur on American soil. Fortunately, or unfortunately from the animal's perspective, Philip's friend Bob Yoakum had cousins in El Paso who could put the rancher in contact with the manager of the Plaza de Toros bullring in Juarez. Bullfighting was legal in the city, and its location just across the border from El Paso meant that Philip could take the buffalo there by train. Felix Robert managed the Plaza de Toros bullring in Juarez. Short, tan, and almost always wearing a bright, wide smile, Robert was a former matador from France. Being a Frenchman in a trade usually dominated by Spaniards distinguished Robert from other bullfighters, as it is eclectic bullfighting techniques. Like traditional Spanish matadors, Robert enticed bulls with a cape, sashayed out of the way when charged, planted barbs in the passing animal's shoulders, and finished the bull with a sword to the heart. What made Robert unique was his incorporation of French bull leaping techniques. He would often carry a bull into the a pole into the bull ring with him, which he would use to vault over a charging bull. Robert's prowess earned praise from no less than the Queen of Spain herself, a fact that the matador was always eager to share. Although a praiseworthy bullfighter, Robert frequently, as a manager, Robert frequently put on awful bullfights. According to newspapers, the Plaza de Toros was less a bullring and more of a butcher shop. Robert employed, por employed poorly trained, slovenly matadors who lumbered about the ring, displaying none of the artistry seen in bullfights in Spain. His bulls were scrawny, mangy, and poorly bred. During bullfights, matadors clumsily stabbed at the pathetic animals, causing unnecessary pain and blood loss. Things were not much better for the bullfighters. Robert's matadors often found themselves punctured by a bull's horn, and there had been multiple human deaths in the Plaza de Toros. Just a year before, Robert had to cut a short a tour in Tijuana because Americans had grown tired of the poor state of his bullfights, and considering that things were not much, going much better in Juarez, it remained possible that he would soon have to close up shop there as well. Considering this sor sorry state of affairs, when Yoakum's cousin, uh, approached Robert with Philip's idea for a different sort of animal fight, the matador jumped at the opportunity. They made a deal. If the buffalo lost, the South Dakota men would bear the expense of the fight. If the buffalo won, Robert would pay the Americans' expenses and Philip would receive a portion of the gate receipts. Robert scheduled the event for Sunday, January 27, 1907, telegrammed Philip, and set out to find a suitable bull. The, usually, the usual scrawny bovines that he used in his bullring would not do for such a large event. He needed a true Mexican fighting bull, the kind that possessed an unnatural aggression due to hundreds of years of selective breeding. It seems that Robert found such an animal. Newspapers differ on the bull's origins, some saying that it hailed from Chihuahua and others Durango, but most agree that Robert found an excellent specimen that exceeded 1,000 pounds and looked nothing like the cheap animals usually on display in his shows. Now that he had a date and a, lo and a location, Robert scoured his herd for a buffalo to ship to Juarez. After careful consideration, he whittled his selection down to two animals. One was eight-year-old alpha male Pierre, 
named after Fort Pierre, who weighed nearly a ton and was among the largest in the herd. Unsure if Pierre's size would be a detriment in a fight with a fast-moving bull, Philip also considered a smaller but faster four-year-old man, male, who he named, uh, who he called Pierre Jr. Unable to pick between the two animals and fearing that an injury might derail the whole operation, Philip took, bo took both, herding the bison onto a specially outfitted train car for the journey south. Bob Yoakum and ranch head Eb Jones joined Philip on the trip. Just as the train prepared to depart in early January 1907, a massive snowstorm hit Fort Pierre, threatening to freeze Philip's cattle herds. Although he longed to see his buffalo compete, Philip decided that he needed to stay in Fort Pierre to care for his livestock. In his stead, he sent his 27-year-old nephew, George Philip. Although level-headed and intelligent, George had less experience working with bison, having spent much of the last decade attending law school. After a series of delays in the long trade ride, George, Jones, Yoakum, and the Buffalo arrived in Juarez on the morning of January 27, the day of the fight. Knowing that the animals would be in poor shape from being cooped up in the train for the past week, George hoped to delay the showdown with the bull. The circular scattered throughout the town. The large crowd gathered at the Plaza de Toros, and Felix Roberts' actions quickly informed him of the impossibility of this plan. With crowds already piling into the Plaza de Toros, Robert had his men offload the buffalo and bring them to the bullring before the men from the Dakotas even exited the train. By the time George Phillip and his companions made their way to the bullring to meet Robert, attendants were already preparing the buff buffalo to fight. When George met Robert then, the only thing left to do was to decide which of the two animals would fight. George settled on eight-year-old Pierre. Although he did not write down his thought process, it is possible that George saw Robert's chosen fighting bull and realized that even speedy Pierre Jr. would be unable to outrun, it, outrun its horns. Pierre's size advantage, on the other hand, might make a difference in the fight. Both animals had fans in the audience. Because Robert had advertised the fight in both the United States and Mexico, the crowd was evenly divided between Americans and Mexicans. This would be the first visit to a bull ring for most of the Americans, many of whom had come only to support the United States-born Pierre. It would also be their last time in a bull ring. When the day opened with traditional bullfights, many Americans grew sick when they saw Robert's inept bullfighters awkwardly slaughter three bulls, an ironic reaction from the spectators there to witness two animals fight to the death. When one bull chased a matador over a fence, the Americans cheered, mocked bullfighting as a sport, and grumbled that it was time to get on with the main event. Whether it was the American revulsion to their sport or sympathy for the Mexican-born bull, the Mexicans in the Plaza de Toros rooted against the buffalo. It is possible that some in the crowd saw the contest in nationalistic terms. In 1907, Mexico was on the precipice of revolution, owing, in part, to Mexican President Porfirio Diaz's pro-American policies. He allowed United States companies to exploit Mexican workers and permitted the sale of huge swaths of land in Mexico to private American citizens. Some in the crowd had probably been alive when the United States defeated Mexico in the Mexican-American War and annexed half of their country. To many Mexicans, the United States was a bully, providing ammunition to cheer the Mexican bull to take down one of America's symbols. The chances of this happening looked good when fight time arrived. When the bull ring's gates opened, Pierre lumbered through them as if he had not a care in the world. He showed no reaction to the crowd, sauntered to the ring, and just stood there, looking more like a statue than a dangerous animal. Although his size amazed those who had never seen a buffalo before, Pierre's lethargy uh, had many in the crowd laughing. George Philip was not among them. He realized too late that Pierre had an injured knee, likely incurred while the animal kicked the side of his train car on the way to Juarez. The buffalo would have to fight hurt. On the contrary, the bull that Robert had chosen was at full health and looked menacing when he stormed out of his pen into the arena. Without a moment of hesitation, the bovine set his sights on Pierre, dropped his horns, snorted, and charged, aiming for the buffalo's exposed side. Pierre just stood there, perpendicular to the bull, looking blissfully unaware that a dangerous animal was preparing to embed its horns in his side. To those in attendance, it looked like the buffalo was about to go down. He was not. When the charging bull came within a few feet of Pierre, the buffalo pivoted toward the 
incomer, swung out his rear legs, lowered his head, and drove it into the bull's forehead. The collision of the two animals' thick skulls produced an awful, sickening thud that reverberated throughout the arena, silencing the crowd. Newspapers reported that the sound echoed for blocks. The bull had just received a harsh lesson in bison ethology. Whereas bulls use forward momentum in their hind legs to drive into opponents, buffalo rely on gravity in their front legs for power. They kick out their small hind quarters and allow gravity in their foreleg muscles to ram their dense skull and horns. They do not need to run to build momentum and can turn on a dime. The bull had been running not toward a defenseless opponent, but rather one that was fully prepared to fight. The head-on impact dazed both animals. It seems that the bull was the first to recover from the blow because he circled Pierre and went to gore at him a second time. Again, the buffalo turned at the last second and met his opponent head on. The bull's third charge met the same fate. The repeated blows finally began to affect both animals. Owing to concussion, his injured knee, or a combination of the two, Pierre stumbled, lost his footing, and collapsed. Fortunately for the buffalo, the bull did not attempt to gore his downed opponent, likely because he too was stunned. Refusing... Uh, Refusing to let the match end so soon, the crowd grew angry and began to boo, forcing Robert to order, order an attendant into the crowd to goad the, bu goad the buffalo into attacking the bull. The attendant crept into the arena, clutching a long metal pole, which he used to poke Pierre's side. In response, the buffalo angri angrily rose to his feet, but instead of rushing his bovine opponent, he went after the guy who had just poked him with a stick. The sight of the charging one-ton animal sent the man running. He was able to make it to the side of the arena, but just as he was climbing over the top of the fence, one of Pierre's horns pierced his side. Thankfully for the attendant, he was able to drop to safety before the buffalo could do any serious damage. The interlude with the attendant allowed the fighting bull to regain his composure, and as soon as Pierre turned his attention away from the fence, he found himself face to face with the bull. Once again, the animals collided but this time they locked their horns and began twisting their heads in a struggle for domination. Horns dragged across flesh, opening wounds. Minutes passed before the two animals found separation. Once free, the bloody and battered bull lined up for another charge. Again, Pierre was ready. He reared up and looking uninjured and displaying none of his previous lethargy, he met his opponent with his most forceful headbutt yet. The bull collapsed. Realizing that he had been bested, the bovine quickly returned to his feet and fled to the other side of the bull ring. The sight of the retreating bull changed Pierre, instilling aggressiveness within him. No longer content to remain on the defensive, the large bison chased down his opponent and thrust his horns into his flesh. He did not stop at one blow, but instead opened a series of gashes. Counts differ on the severity of the wounds, but one newspaper indicated that they were so substantial the blood covered the arena. Women fainted. Men turned their heads. Eventually, the bull escaped Pierre's assault, fled to the other side of the arena, and began bellowing like a spoiled child. He was unwilling and unable to fight any longer. Pierre snorted and stomped his feet defiantly, but left the bull alone. The Americans in the audience cheered. Although the bull had no fight left in him, and the buffalo was a clear winner, Robert announced that the match was a draw, because both animals were still alive. He operated under traditional bullfighting rules where victory meant the loser died in the ring. Many Americans, wanting Pierre declared the winner, grew angry over the decision. Mexicans in the crowd were similarly vexed. Used to seeing bullfights end in death, they wanted Robert to continue goading the animals to fight again. The bullring manager came up with another way to keep both nationalities happy. He would put another bull in the arena with Pierre. None of his remaining bulls was as big and as tough as the one that had just fought, but perhaps they would be able to capitalize on the bull bison's exhaustion and put up an entertaining fight. When Robert offered the Americans more money if he could carry through with his plan, George Phillip replied, Turn in all the damn bulls you wish, just so you give that buffalo room to turn around. When Robert's men loosed the second bull, it quickly became clear that he lacked the pedigree of his predecessor. When he charged, the now veteran Pierre headbutted him three times in rapid succession, sending the bull fleeing around the ring. Robert brought in a third bull, but it too proved no match for the now aggressive Pierre.
By the end of the afternoon, there were three bulls in the bull ring doing their best to stay away from the buffalo, as, stay as far away from the buffalo as possible. After briefly chasing the animals, Pierre laid down in the center of the ring and took a nap. When attendants opened the gates to signal the end of the fight, the bulls fled out of the arena as fast as they could. Pierre lazily made his way out to overwhelming cheers from the crowd. The buffalo had defeated not just one bull, but three. Although the last two fights were such routes that many newspapers did not even bother to report on them. A few traditional bullfighting fans were dis disappointed that none of the animals died in the combat, but most regarded the fight as a success. Americans crossed the border with stories to tell their neighbors. Cincinnati resident W.S. Crawford was in attendance and took photographs. Telegraph's car cables carried his story and pictures to newspapers across the United States, and some of his photos would later be made into postcards. When Scotty Phillip and the people of Fort Pierre opened their January 28th newspaper, an account of Pierre's victory greeted them. George Phillip and the men from Dakota were happy with their first day in Juarez. They made more money than the trip cost, and they redeemed the reputation of the American bison. Felix Robert had bet money on his bulls and lost, and he had promised the Americans to pay their transportation costs if they won. But he, too, was happy. Having sold out the Plaza de Toros for the first time in its history, ticket sales far outweighed his gambling losses. Success inspired the French matador. Uh, why settle for a single day of ticket sales when the buffalo can make him more money? Robert came up with a plan, proposed it to George Phillip and his companions. He wanted his most famous and really only competent matador, Rasulio Hernandez, nicknamed El Cuco, to fight one of the bison. Known throughout war as a, as a kind and welcoming man, El Cuco was a stone-cold killer in the ring, having dispatched hundreds of bulls during his long career. Years later, George Phillip remembered El Cuco as the Babe Ruth of the Juarez bullring. Mexicans would buy tickets to see their favorite matador redeem their nation after the bulls' poor showing. Americans would attend to cheer their mascot, uh, cheer as their mascot made bullfighting look foolish. George Phillip agreed to Robert's plan because he believed that there was no way that his bison would lose. George even warned Robert that fighting an American bison would be much different than fighting a bull. Whereas cattle have only a thin layer of skin on their backs to protect their spinal column and vital organs, buffalo have thick muscles and a dense fur coating. Because of this, matador barbs would be ineffective against a bison and would more likely end up only upsetting the animals. George dismiss, or Robert dismissed the American's concern and bet $500 that El Cuco would kill his opponent. The ranchers accepted the bet, but only after warning Robert that there was a better chance that the buffalo would kill El Cuco than the matador would kill the buffalo. The Americans decided that Pierre Jr. should be the one to face the matador, feeling that it would be best to allow Pierre to recover from last Sunday's fight, as his leg injury had grown worse. After the two parties agreed on money, Robert started advertising the upcoming event as a showdown between man and beast and set the bout for the following Sunday, February 3rd. Word of the fight spread quickly, sending Mexican elites and rich Americans to Juarez. Once again, the Plaza de Toros sold out, netting Robert $8,000 in ticket sales. Even the governor of Chihuahua decided to attend the fight. Although he would not be traveling to Juarez, President Theodore Roosevelt learned of the showdown when the El Paso Humane Society asked him to contact the president of Mexico to put a stop to the contest. There is no evidence that the president entertained the request. Sunday, February 3rd, 1907 was fight day. Robert hoped to open the event with three traditional bullfights, but thing did not, things did not go as planned. After the first matador and his entourage made their way into the arena, attendants opened the gate holding the first bull. Nothing came out. After some cajoling, a bull emerged, but instead of heading in the direction of the matador, the animal ran to the closest fence and tried to climb out. In a cost-saving measure, Robert had used the same poor animal that Pierre had battered and bruised the week before. Apparently harboring memories of the encounter with the bison, the bull wanted to exit the arena as soon as possible. After failing to climb the fence, the, animals be the animal began circling around the matador and refused to engage him. The fight with Pierre had reduced a prime fighting bull to seeing ghosts. After the first bull refused to fight, Robert had a new matador and bull brought in. The second bull had also fought Pierre the week before, and he too refused to engage the bullfighter. 
Apparently, Robert had not purchased any new bulls, as the third bull to enter the arena had also fought Pierre. He, too, circled the arena in fear. The crowd booed. With the audience upset and the governor of Chihuahua growing angry, Robert prayed that the main event would make up for the disaster that had preceded it. It would not. After El Cuco walked into the bullring to much pomp and circumstance, the gate opened to allow Pierre Jr. to enter. He did so similarly, similar, similarly to Pierre a week before, slowly and with little aggression. When El Cuco began waving his cape in the hopes of angering Pierre Jr., the animal just stared. Whereas fighting bulls charge when they see the motion of a matador cape, nature and breeding had not instilled such an instinct in bison. Unlike Pierre, Pierre Jr. had never been an alpha male, had not faced combat in the ring, and having been raised on Scotty R Phillips' ranch, had nothing to fear from humans. He had no reason to go after the matador. To make the animal angry then, El Cuco ordered a mounted picador to poke the buffalo with a metal pole. The prodding annoyed Pierre Jr., and the animal half-heartedly ran at El Cuco, but he did not seem interested in actually causing harm. El Cuco tried to wave his cape and make it look like he was in danger, but the audience was not buying it. They began to throw cushions into the ring and looked on the verge of rioting. The display disgusted the already agitated governor of Chihuahua. To calm the crowd, he called Robert into his box and told him to call off the fight and refund everyone's money. In an attempt to placate the governor, El Cuco offered to at least execute the buffalo to satiate those in the crowd who had come for blood. The governor dismissed the offer and went further in his punishment. He fined Robert and his bullfighters $500 apiece and suspended El Cuco from bullfighting. As the crowd filed out of the arena, Robert and his staff returned their entrance money. The Americans returned to El Paso for the night disappointed with the day but happy with the trip overall. Although they had missed out on seeing how an aggressive buffalo would fare against a matador, they had made plenty of money from the prior Sunday's fight, and they would be bringing home back bragging rights to Fort Pierre. They even debated taking Pierre to Chihuahua City and Mexico City to put him up against the bed best fighting bulls Mexico had to offer, but decided to instead net $200 by selling the two buffalo to an El Paso, El Paso butcher who planned to slaughter them and use their carcasses as an advertising stunt. After sleeping overnight, the men returned to Juarez to retrieve the buffalo from the Plaza de Toros, where, according to George Phillip, they found Robert sitting in his office surrounded by his matadors. The Frenchman was angry. He informed the Americans about the lost $8,000 in refunds and more in fines. To Robert, it had been the Americans and Pierre Jr.'s unwillingness to fight that were to blame for the loss. He went further in his indictments, accused Bob Yoakum of flirting with the wife of one of his matadors. To recoup his losses and restore his bullfighter's honor, Robert informed the Americans that he planned to sue them, and until trial they had to wait in Juarez's notoriously dangerous jail to ensure that they would not skip out on their debt. George Phillip and his companions grew angry, but before the Americans could consider leaving, they noticed that Robert's matadors had them surrounded, and each was wearing a shiny six-shooter on his belt. Unarmed, unwilling to spend what could be months in the Juarez jail, and believing the matador might order his men to fire on them if they tried to escape, George Phillip cut a deal with Robert. If the matador called off the lawsuit, they would allow him to keep Pierre. They would take Pierre Jr. to sell to a local butcher. Although George's story may have happened just as he said, there are some discrepancies. Robert could be shady, and it would not be beyond him to demand the buffalo to cover expenses. However, he was a businessman, not a gunfighter, so it is unlikely that he intentionally had his men appear threatening. Whatever happened, George, Bob Yoakum, and Eb Jones left El Paso with no bison when they boarded a train to Fort Pierre. Any disappointment they might have had over the circumstances was short-lived. When they arrived home, Scotty Phillip had the people of Fort Pierre greeted, greet them as heroes. Eb Jones continued to work on Scotty Phillips' ranch, while Bob Yoakum ran a general store in Fort Pierre. George Phillip continued to help on his uncle's ranch and became a lawyer in Fort Pierre. Later in life, he wrote down the story of his time in Mexico in his memoirs. The, fiat, the fate of Pierre is less clear, as inconsistencies between sources and the fact that Robert no longer called the buffalo by its name make it impossible to follow him. Initially, it seemed that Robert planned to offset the blowback he received from the local Humane Society by announcing in April 1907 that he planned to do donate a five-year-old buffalo to either the Humane Society or the city of El Paso. 
the age indicates that this was Pierre Jr., not Pierre. And considering the discrepancies in George Phillips' version of events, this is certainly possible. However, it is more likely that the buffalo was Pierre and Robert had the age wrong. Whatever the case, after receiving the offer, city officials met with members of the Humane Society and accepted, announcing that they planned to display the animal in Washington Park for educational purposes. After learning of their plans, Robert rescinded his offer, fearing that the exhibit would serve as, quote, a counter-attraction to the bullfight. Instead, in May 1907, Robert showed the buffalo in the Juarez bullring, but did not put the animal in harm's way, on account of the fact that manager Robert has other plans for the big buffalo, reported one newspaper. The plan was that after the close of bullfighting season, Robert was to bring Pierre to Mexico City, where on July 7th, the buffalo will be fought against a bull of Spanish fighting blood. Robert intended to bet $10,000 on the buffalo and said that he would take it to Madrid if he won. The trip to Mexico City does not seem to have taken place in 1907, with one report indicating that Pierre was still nursing his injured leg. By early the following year, Pierre seems finally to have recovered from his injury, and on April 10, 1908, Robert advertised that Quote, a war between the United States and Mexico will be declared on Sunday in the Juarez Bullring when a big American bison and a wild bull from the heart of the Sierra Madre will be pitted against each other. He ordered a small wooden arena to be constructed within the bullring. This would prevent the animals from running away as the bulls had done in the fight with Pierre the previous year and would ensure the battle was to the death. El Paso newspapers offer little information on the fight, but a woman who witnessed the event later relayed what happened to George Philip when she met him in Fort Pierre. According to the woman, four bulls faced off against Pierre that day. None survived. Apparently, the wooden enclosure was well suited to the bison's method of headbutting, while the bulls lacked space to build up momentum for their charges. One by one, the bulls were led uh, down a small chute into the enclosure to battle Pierre. No longer resembling the timid, docile animal that had entered the ring in January 1907, Pierre aggressively attacked each of his opponents, driving them to the side of the enclosure and then goring them with his short horns. According to the woman, Pierre hit one of his opponents so hard that the bull's lifeless body broke through the wooden enclosure and spilled out the other side. The only difference in the version reported in the El Paso Times is that the bull was the one who broke through the fence, smashing through to escape the buffalo. The woman who spoke with George Phillips said that following the victory, Robert planned to bring Pierre to Madrid to face off against the world's very best fighting bulls. This appears to be true, as in the summer of 1908, Robert planned a dual honeymoon money-making trip to Spain. He first had the buffalo transferred from Juarez to El Paso. After the El Paso Port Authority and the chief of the Bureau of Animal Industry signed off, Robert shipped Pierre to Galveston, where it was then sent to New Orleans and finally Barcelona. Pierre seems to have fought at least once in Madrid, likely on September 13, 1808 or 1908, but Spanish newspapers carried no details of the bout. All indications are that Pierre remained in Spain for the rest of his life, as Robert returned to Juarez from Europe soon thereafter with no buffalo. In spite of this, the Toreador would again turn to using buffalo in his shows in 1911 when he advertised another fight between a matador and a buffalo in Salt Lake City. The results of this contest are unknown, but the bout involved neither El Cuco nor Pierre. A bull had shattered El Cuco's back years before, and the buffalo was from a local ranch. If you guys like this story, there is a new book uh, I wrote called Roman Spectacle on the Rio Grande. It's got more stories about these crazy animal fights that took place in Juarez from 1895 to 1913. These fights include a tiger versus a bull, elephant versus four bulls, a bear versus a lion, a uh, lion versus a bull, bear versus a bull, just these crazy wild things. And there's a whole book full of them, uh, Roman Spectacle on the Rio Grande. Check the link out in the comments.